Good morning. Welcome to the second annual Illinois State Legislative Breakfast on LGBTQ BT plus Asian issues presented by the Equity Illinois and Pride Action Tank, a multi-issue think and action tank on LGBTQ plus issues and a project of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. My name is Caprice Carthens and my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a member of the board of directors of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, AFC. I am also a prevention specialist, a uh, 2020 inductee into the LGBTQ Hall of Fame here in Chicago, as well as a uh, board member of AFC. I'm honored to be with you this morning to discuss issues that LGBTQ people, including those living with HIV and AIDS, face as they grow older. AFC works to meet the evolving needs of older adults with HIV and long-term survivors. Our research of older, with, uh, of older adults with HIV studies and related activities, the Getting to Zero Working Group on Aging, and our senior services case managers are just three examples of our commitment to this population. In 2016, Pride Action Tank, or PAT, began working to center LGBT plus older adults in aging. We started with uh, out aging, a summit of our possibilities, and since then have helped incubate One Roof Chicago, an organization focused on a future of mixed income, multi generational housing development, and workforce development initiative, partnered with Equity Illinois on the passage of. Uh, bill number SB1319, the Equity for LGBTQ Older Adults Act, and collaborates to develop and implement the outreach, advocating for safe and inclusive spaces for LGBT older adults initiative, which brings us here today. Our goals for today's programs are to educate attendees on the joys and needs of LGBTQ older adults and caregivers and to obtain support for the LGBT plus aging bills and GTC getting to zero bills, omnibus bills, that will be introduced next session. During this breakfast, we hope to have some stories from the LGBT older adults who just completed our last storytelling for trained training cohort and, and one panel for each for the bills topics that I just mentioned. So hopefully our, our technician can, will, will be able to allow those to happen. If not, they will be uploaded and presented to you at a later date. There will be a bit of time for questions from the tent, from the audience after each panel. So please put questions in the chat as they come up. We're also streaming live on the Facebook pages of Pride Action Tank and Equity Illinois will check with questions there. I want to thank the many states elected and, and appointed officials and their staffs, service providers and advocates for being with this, us this morning to talk about this important issue. I also want to thank the, the funder for PAT, LGBT plus older adults work, the RRF Foundation for Aging. And now I'll turn things over to Don Bell. Thank you, Caprice. I had to remember to demute for a change. <laughs> thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Donald M. Bell, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a member of Pride Action Tank's Out Aging Committee and a number of other advocacy groups for the aging uh, in general and LGBT aging in particular. The outreach initiative that Caprice mentioned is one example of the collaborative approach Pride Action Tank employs. This initiative is the brainchild of the Out Aging Committee which consists of LGBT plus older adults uh, like yours truly, uh, business owners, service providers, advocacy organizations, and scholars. Now today we hope to present uh, two of our speakers from the latest iteration of our uh, Storytelling for Change cohort. And how are we doing with that, Dante? So are we able to present now? Okay, it looks like we still won't be able to bring you that presentation at this moment, but we will prepare it for you for later. And if not, we'll send it to you because I want to honor the commitments of the two people who prepared to present to you today. First was uh, Lee Payne, and Lee has 30 years experience in social services, education, and community organizing. 
Lee is a social justice activist for women, children, and members of the aging community. Lee has a bachelor's degree in sociology and criminal justice from Murray State University. She has resided in Chicago since 1965, and Lee is from Western Kentucky. And then after the policy panel, we hope to present Larry Lesperance, uh, who will share his story. Larry is a retired teacher and social worker. He is an active volunteer in multiple gay and straight organizations. He does public speaking for the Center on Halstead, focusing on gay aging. He addresses both college classes and those who work with seniors. Larry's retirement goals are to do some good and have some fun. Larry believes that Chicago and Illinois are great places to live if you tap into the resources. So I hope to be able to bring them, those people to you later. And I wanna add my thanks as a member of the first generation of out aging LGBT members. Uh, I'm a third generation native born Chicagoan South Sider. So Illinois is my home. I'm also an alumnus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So in the words of one of my late uh, classmates, Dan Fogelberg, I'd like to say, Illinois, I'm your boy. Now we'll pass on to the next presenter. Good morning, my name is Britta Larson. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Senior Services Director at Center on Halstead and a member of the Out Aging Committee. And this morning, I'm going to introduce the panelists for the LGBT plus aging policy panel in the order that they will speak today. Aaron Tax is the Director of Advocacy for SAGE. He advocates for LGBT inclusive federal aging policies that account for the unique needs of LGBT older adults. Until June 2011, Aaron served as the legal director of Service Members Legal Defense Network, SLDN, uh, the leading organization challenging Don't Ask, Don't Tell in Congress and the courts. A graduate of Cornell University with honors and distinction and the George Washington University Law School with honors, he currently resides in Washington, DC. Mary Anderson is the Chicago director for AARP Illinois, where she directs AARP's strategy for the Northern Illinois region. Mary brings considerable experience and talents to the position as an accomplished executive and leader in Illinois government. Mary holds a Juris Doctorate from New York University School of Law, Masters of Public Affairs, Certificate in Urban and Regional Planning from Princeton University, and a Bachelor of Arts with high honors in political science and economics from Swarthmore College. Mike Ziri, he, him, is the Director of Pol Public Policy at Equality Illinois, the state's civil rights organization for LGBTQ people. Mike spearheads an aggressive legislative agenda in Springfield, builds and strengthens relationships with officials and political leaders throughout Illinois and in Washington, DC, and develops policy initiatives. He is motivated to build a better Illinois by values of justice, inclusion, equity, and equality. Mike earned his bachelor's degree at Illinois College in Jacksonville and has a master's degree uh, from the University of Illinois Springfield. Mike will serve as the moderator for questions for our bill sponsors and audience Q&A. Selma D'Souza is the chief of staff at the Illinois Department on Aging. Prior to joining, the Department on Aging, she was the executive director of the Indo-American Center in Chicago, a direct service agency serving immigrants, including seniors. She has also served as the chief of the Office of Legislative Affairs at the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services. Prior to working in state government, she was a partner for many years at the law firm of D'Souza Wosorski LTD in Chicago. We'll hear from the We'll also hear from the sponsors of the legislative package to be discussed during the panel. Senator Karina Vina Villa was born and raised in West Chicago, Illinois, which makes her a lifelong resident of Illinois' 25th district. She was elected to the Illinois Senate on November 3rd, 2020, and is a passionate advocate for students and families with a strong record of service to the community. Senator Villa is the first Latina to represent the 25th district. Senator Villa earned a master's degree in social work from Aurora University. She became a school social worker and has worked in the West 
Chicago, and Villa Park school systems. State Representative Lakeisha Collins has represented the 9th District of Illinois since July 24, 2020. She is a Chicago native who was raised by her grandmother, a stroke survivor. As a result, addressing the needs of others has become part of her DNA. After graduating from Proviso East High School, Representative Collins pursued her passion to care for others and acquired a certification as a certified nursing assistant and provided years of service to residents in several Chicago nursing homes. While working in those nursing homes, Representative Collins felt the impact that issues like low staffing levels and high workloads had on the quality of care workers uh, that they were able to deliver to residents. She also felt the impact low wages for the type of labor had on workers. In 2019, Lakeisha received the Florence Criley Award from the Chicago chapter of the Coalition of Labor Women. The award recognizes activism and leadership, as well as the ability to inspire young women to take leadership roles in their organizations. And now I'll turn it over to Aaron Tax to get the discussion started for us. All right, thanks so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful to partner with you, Britta, and Pride Action Tank, and Mary Anderson with AERP, and uh, Mike Siri with Equality Illinois. Uh, and you've been amazing partners over the past few years. So what I'm going to do today is provide some uh, background information on something called the Older Americans Act, which I know some of you are already familiar with on the call today. So the Older Americans Act, known as the OAA, is the primary vehicle for the organization and delivery of social and nutrition programs in our country. And it funds critical programs like Meals on Wheels, chore assistance, transportation assistance, senior centers, a whole slew of programs that enable people to age in place in their communities. And when the law was updated or reauthorized uh, just last year, we got some really great language in the law that requires three things of the entire aging network, mean, meaning every state unit on aging, like the Illinois Department of Aging, and area agencies on aging, which are generally speaking, county departments of aging, including all the ones that you have in Illinois. So this language, um, and the updated or reauthorized OAA requires three things of the aging network. Number one, to engage in outreach to LGBT older people. Two, to collect data on their needs. And three, to collect data on whether they're meeting their needs. And we've been partnering uh, with Paula Basta uh, in the Illinois Department of Aging and the AAAs around Illinois to make sure that they're aware of this uh, language and to work with them to provide the resources and information they need to reach out to LGBT older people and making sure they're counted and that we're aware of their needs. And uh, we've been working uh, again with our allies, including Pride Action Tank and uh, Equality Illinois and Britta and ARP and making sure, um, you know, this is a reality for LGBT old people that they're seen and that they're heard and that they can get the resources and support that they need. We're also working very closely with them on implementing the law in Illinois that passed just a few years ago, explicitly designating LGBT older people, as well as those living with HIV as great as social needs or target populations in the state of Illinois. Um, we're excited to continue partnering on that work. Um, and final, finally, this will be my, my, my segue to one of the next speakers. Uh, we've been super excited to work with all the folks on this call today on a report with ARP Illinois called Disrupting Disparities, which really highlights the challenges that LGBT older people face and some of the policy solutions that we could bring to bear to make sure we address those challenges. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker, but thanks so much for having me on here today, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Erin. And I'm going to share my screen so we can talk about this fantastic report. So, so yeah, just to remind folks, I'm Mary Anderson. I'm Chicago Director and Director of Advocacy and Outreach for Northern Illinois for AARP Illinois. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about all the great work we're doing together collaboratively. And in particular, this work, um, Disrupting Disparities, that we did, I, AARP Illinois did in partnership with SAGE. Uh, this is report that we just released this fall, looking on the experiences of LGBTQ older adults in Illinois. And we would not have been able to do this report without our great partners that are here on this call. So let me talk about this report. So this report, we gather data, national data, uh, data, statewide data, and local data through different reports, uh, researches and, um, and different surveys about the experiences of LGBTQ older adults in the state of Illinois. 
And while the data for the report is staggering, uh, it's actually not very surprising. And what we found is significant disparities for LGBTQ older adults in Illinois. And those disparities are rooted in a lifetime of discrimination. Uh, these disparities come from a lack of legal and social recognition, a reliance on our chosen families, as well as reduced access to inclusive services and other social determinants of health. Now, these disparities also are often compounded and are even greater for LGBTQ older adults of color. So the report we organized into three different areas that we examined. We looked at economic security, we looked at health and well-being, as well as caregiving and social connections. So let's talk about economic security first. So one third of LGBTQ older adults live at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. Now this is compared to about a quarter of non-LGBTQ older adults. And we see these disparities in particular in retirement savings. So 83% of LGBTQ older adults rely almost entirely on social security benefits for their retirement savings. And then these disparities get worse as the as LGBTQ older adults age. And here's why, because the vast majority of LGBTQ older adults do not qualify for social security uh, survivor benefits. They do not qualify to have access to their partner's retirement pension and do not qualify to have access to their partner's retirement benefits. Now, why is that? Um, because of decades of non-legal recognition of LGBTQ family relationships. Now, yes, we do have marriage equality now, right? And domestic partnerships are being uh, recognized. But for many LGBTQ older adults, these recognitions came too late in their lives to be able to have access to those really important retirement savings. Now, let's talk about healthcare. Uh, so LGBTQ older adults have significant challenges finding health insurance coverage and access that is inclusive and meets their needs. Now, I must admit, this was the area that um, we had the hardest time finding the most comprehensive state level data. Most of our data was either at the national level or at the local level. But for example, uh, there is a Chicago area survey that showed that LGBTQ older adults, two thirds of them identified health insurance and access to physical health uh, uh, services as their top priorities. Then we have caregiving and social connection. And I have to say this, this part of the report had some of the most stunning findings. So underneath this section, we found that almost a quarter of LGBTQ people over the age of 50 have provided care to their friends. Now, because, and why is this? Because LGBTQ older adults are twice as likely to live alone as their, their non-LGBTQ peers. And three out of four LGBTQ older adults are concerned about having enough support from their family and friends as they age. Now, many of us older LGBTQ adults, we provide care to our friends as part of our chosen family. Because of decades of discrimination in our legal and social structures, we don't have necessarily traditional family to, to fall upon. And what's frustrating is that many of the um, caregiving programs and benefits uh, that are out there are actually structured to and, and address traditional family structures and they don't necessarily recognize um, chosen family structures, which makes it harder for LGBTQ older adults and our chosen families to be able to access many of those programs and services. Um, we're also, there's a, there's a definite challenge in accessing inclusive programs and services. So fewer than half of LGBTQ older adults say they can find inclusive older adult services. And in particular, if you look at urban areas versus rural areas, uh, those old LGBTQ older adults in larger cities, about, um, about half can find those inclusive services. But LGBTQ older adults in rural areas, only 10% can find inclusive services. So what are we going to do about this? Well, here we go. We actually have in the report a, a significant list of different policy recommendations. And those policy recommendations really fall under three areas. A comprehensive strategy to support LGBTQ older people equal access to inclusive programs and services, 
And as I've been saying through this whole thing, LGBTQ inclusive data collection. Gathering more data is really important so we're able to tell the story of the experiences of older adults in Illinois. So I'm going to turn it now over to my colleague, Michael Ziri of Equality Illinois, because we have a legislative agenda to, that's gonna take some of these policy recommendations and hopefully put them into law. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you everyone um, for joining us today. Thanks, Pride Action Tank, um, for, for allowing us the opportunity to partner on this really exciting, uh, not just this event today, but on the, the legislative package. It's been really wonderful to work with. Mary and Kim um, and, and Britta and Don and Serena and Aaron um, on, on this work. And, and so as, as Mary said, we've um, based on the report and, and also the great work that's been done over, um, over the years by you know, the organizations that are part of this event today, but also all of you who are watching, um, we're gonna be building on the good work that's already been done in Illinois. Um, and you've heard about a couple of the bills you know, just this year we passed a new law with the support of the legislators um, you'll hear from in a little bit, um, a bill about data collection. Um, and so we're already hitting the ground running with the recommendations in the report, hitting the ground running before the report even came out. Um, but we have some work that we wanna do to help keep building, make sure Illinois stays a, a truly great welcoming and affirming state for LGBTQ older adults, and older adults living with HIV. And so, because of that, we have a legislative proposal we're working on for the 22 legislative session. Um, and it's a three-parter um, and it's based on report, as I said. Um, it also, um, I know you'll hear from Selma uh, in a moment from the Department on Aging, but it also honors the work that the department has been doing, that Director Paula Basta has been doing um, to make sure programming is inclusive, make sure programming supports LGBTQ older adults in Illinois. Um, so I wanna make sure that we recognize that these proposals honor the, um, the work of the department. And so it's, a, as I said, it's a three-parter. Um, the first part is it would create a, a three-year commission on LGBTQ aging, which would provide a, a comprehensive review of programs and services and, and those challenges that Mary talked about and what solutions can be. Uh, it'd be an opportunity to hear testimony for impacted folks to share stories. Um, and uh, of course, it wouldn't be a commission without recommendations. So there'll be recommendations that come out of it as well. So that's the first part, a three-year commission on LGBTQ aging. Really excited about that. The um, uh, second part is uh, uh, it would require trainings um, that are already happening through the Department on Aging for providers, for like, the area agencies on aging. Um, so really codifying the good work being done by the department there for LGBTQ older adults. And then also um, it, would, uh, it would have the director of the Department on Aging designate an LGBTQ older adult advocate, someone at the department to make sure the experiences and needs of LGBTQ older adults are being included throughout all the programming of the department um, and the services. Uh, and also someone that the LGBTQ older adults, older adults with HIV could send questions to or turn to. Um, so, we're excited about this legislation. We're excited to have our sponsors and I know we'll have some questions for them um, in a moment. Um, but I will say, I don't think we could pick two better sponsors for this piece of legislation. They're both enthusiastic champions. Um, but before I talk and we hear from the sponsors, I wanna turn it over to uh, our friend Selma uh, from the Illinois Department on Aging. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for asking the Illinois Department on Aging to participate. Uh, the mission of the department is to serve an advocate for older Illinoisans and their caregivers by administering quality and culturally appropriate programs that promote partnerships and encourage independence, dignity, and quality of life. Our agency director, Paula Basta, has worked with LGBTQ community organizations for decades to make sure services and programs for older adults in Illinois are inclusive. Under her leadership, our department and our aging network are working to make sure all older adults in Illinois have access to the services they need to age with dignity. At the Illinois Department on Aging, we are including the needs of LGBTQ older adults in everything we do. In our new three-year state plan, which you can uh, find on our website, 
We have specific objectives relating to LGBTQ older adults. We are providing cultural competency training to IDOA staff, our 13 area agencies on aging, which are also known as AAAs, and other aging network providers throughout the state. And we have representation from the LGBTQ community on the Illinois Council on Aging. We are proud of the work our area agencies on aging are doing that go above and beyond to ensure inclusive services for LGBTQ older adults. Some AAAs require SAGE training for their service providers and employees. Others have special programs that reach LGBTQ older, across, uh, older adults across the state and create an inclusive community. This outreach helps connect seniors with the resources they need and prevents isolation. For example, Age Options based in Cook County hosts regular Thrive with Pride online cafes that work to bring together LGBTQ older adults, including older adults living with HIV. Another one of our AAAs, Age Link, recently hosted a screening of the documentary Gen Silent as part of their LGBTQ programming and they plan to offer drag bingo as a new event once COVID cases decline. Additionally, as trusted community hubs, our AAAs help connect LGBTQ older adults with medical services through GLMA, health professionals advocating LGBT equality, and with resources through SAGE. We want Illinois to continue to serve in supporting LGBTQ older adults and we look forward to continued collaboration with Equality Illinois, AARP, Pride Action Tank, and our partners in the General Assembly to accomplish this shared goal. The Department on Aging supports the spirit of the legislative package that Mike described. We want Illinois to continue to be one of the best places in the nation to live and thrive as one ages. Thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions later I'm turning it over to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Selma. And I am excited because now I get to hear from and ask some questions of, of our two legislative champions, Representative Collins and Senator Villa. Uh, and let me pull up the questions here real quick. Um, and so, you know, I know I share the sentiments of everyone on this panel today uh, of thanking you for agreeing to sponsor. I know we, we met with both of you a few weeks ago and we, we love the conversations. We love uh, the chatting with you. And we we're so excited that you said yes to sponsor the bill. And so just to start off, um, can you share why for you it's important that you sponsor this disrupting disparities legislative package for LGBTQ older adults? And, and is there a particular reason, event or, or person that compels you to do so? And uh, Love to hear from both of you. Mike and Lakeisha, good morning. And to everyone else on the panel as well. Some of my favorite humans in the whole world on one Zoom. I can't believe it. How lucky am I? Um, welcome to everyone. I hope you're enjoying your breakfast this morning. I'll jump right in, Raph, if that's OK. And then we'll uh, piggyback off of each other. Um, so I am the state senator of the 25th Senate District, which is all the way out west. So covers parts of DuPage, Kendall, Kane County, and just a tiny hair of Cook County. So one of the things that's so important to me since I became a, an elected official was having um, advisory committees within the district. And one of the committees that is one of my absolute favorite is my senior advisory committee. In this committee, we have um, seniors from all across the district who come and talk to me about their experiences um, with different systems in, in Illinois. And it's really um, pretty, pretty amazing how much knowledge this group of, of um, seniors have to share with me. But it's also extremely heartbreaking when I hear from them their experiences with ageism in our society. So when this 
uh, piece of legislation, when this group um, came to me and, and had a conversation about what they were working on, I remember, Mike, like right before you all asked if I'd be willing to sponsor the legislation, I jumped right in and I was like, can I sponsor this, the legislation? You know, because um, it's just such a, such a critical issue for me. Um, back when I was in college, I actually uh, volunteered for Canical Ministries out in Wheaton, Illinois, which is a group that works with um, people who are um, HIV positive um, out in suburbia. And that experience also taught me so, so much about what um, folks have, have to go through um, in living in the shadows. And, and really to me, like the diversity and in, in representation of the issue from Chicago with, with Rep um, Collins to the suburbs with, with myself, I think it just really goes to show that, that, that these topics are relevant for people across the state of Illinois. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. Hi, I'm um, Representative Lakeisha Collins from the 9th District. Thank you all for having me on today and thank you for even considering me to um, sponsor this bill with such a great Senator um, who I love dearly. Um, but yes, this is personable to me because you know, I was a nursing home worker for about 11 years and I dealt with, you know, seniors and um, some of my seniors were, were part of the LGBTQ community and some lived with HIV. And so I saw up close and personal the discrimination and heard the personable stories, um, stories from the Stonewall riots and, you know, all of the, you know, um, barriers that our seniors had to deal with, but also on a more personal level because, you know, I had family members as well. I had an uncle who passed away from HIV, but who was openly gay. Um, and then I have cousins right now, I have best friends. And so just being able to give voice and, you know, advocate on behalf of this population is, you know, always important to me. And so I'm just really honored to you know, even have a chance to, um, you know, do this on a whole different level with making this law. So um, that's my piece. Absolutely. And we're so grateful that you both again said yes. Um, and I hope everyone watching can see why they're going to be two phenomenal champions. And they're already phenomenal champions. They've been doing great work. Um, so I want to fast forward um, uh, to when the bill is, when the bill passes, the governor signs it. You know, um, not that there is no lot of work that happens in between there. There is, there is. But what what do you hope will be true for LGBTQ older adults and older adults living with HIV after this bill becomes law? What do you hope will be true for the state of Illinois? You want to go, Senator, or you want me to go? Jump in. Can you hear me? Oh. So just from a nursing home point of view um, and just in general, right? Um, I, I'm thinking about, you know, the fact that when we talk about care plans, what does that mean for our, our aging population who is a part of the LGBTQ community, right? Making sure that it's something that is tailored to their needs, that they have a voice, that they're able to, you know, um, advocate on behalf of, you know, their needs inside of facilities that, you know, oftentimes workers or staff um, or even in administration don't really understand um, how to, you know, tailor their care plans around them, but also that we are moving closer to a more inclusive environment for our community and that, you know, um, it's not just about only giving a voice, but that, you know, we're really putting fire to, you know, um, this industry. And I'll talk about the industry because nursing homes is an industry that lacks in so many different areas. And this is just one that we could really just put a dent in, so. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of what Rep Collins is saying, you know, we saw um, just atrocities that happened um, during COVID and, the folks who, who ended up losing their lives who were in nursing homes. And I think that for a long time, we've known in Illinois that there's been some real, um, just real tough things going on in these nursing homes, right? And I think that this is 
this is the time right now because you know COVID brought all of this to light. Like we're no longer sweeping things under the rug, right? Like this all has come to light that there has to be changes and that um, we have to make sure that all all folks are being um, considered, that their rights um, are being heard. You know, my, my office has been working diligently on SB 1633, which is um, the Nursing um, Home Patients uh, Rights Act. And we're working on amending it because we've seen just how, um, you know, our seniors just aren't being seen as um, the same way that that maybe someone in their 40s is seen in our society, especially when when they are in nursing homes. So this bill just um, what, what I hope will happen after the signing is that um, there will be, there will be equity um, and, and that the, those who are caring for for LGBTQ plus adults. Um, have a, a different level of empathy and also that those who are LGBTQ plus living in nursing homes, that they don't feel like they have to regress and go back any any steps. Um, I, I think that to, to me, that's just heartbreaking to hear that, you know, that was one of the things that you brought up on, on our call that we had that um, seniors often, um, when they go into these homes, uh, feel like they can't express who they are. And that's just heartbreaking to me. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your support of the legislation. We're so excited to get to work with you. Um, I know we have time for maybe one or two audience questions. And I, I see Antonio King has um, shared a question. Um, and I'll, I'll initially send it to our sponsors, but I think anyone maybe on the panel can answer it as well. But um, what can community members do to support um, a, the question is AARP's efforts, uh, but I'm also gonna make it broadly. What can community members do to support the legislation or LGBTQ older adult advocacy? Um, so um, I know uh, Senator Villa, you mentioned you have a, an advisory council. So I wanted to turn it over to our sponsors to see um, what you think community members can do and then anybody on the panel as well. So, oh, go ahead, Senator. I was gonna say, um, when, when we introduced this legislation, you know, slipping, right? Making sure that you're sending in your support. Um, the stories mean a lot, right? Um, people with the lived experience who can talk about what it's like to live in those shoes, to go through this um, and try to navigate through this um, system. Um, that, that really helps when we're trying to pass legislation. Um, but the support as far as slipping in, you know, um, the more the better, because it builds pressure. I'm also an organizer, <laughs> so I'm all about numbers. And when we show up in numbers, we always win. And so that's one way to do it. And then Senator, I don't know what you were gonna say. And aside from uh, slipping, I think that also, um, if, if you live in an area where maybe historically your Senator hasn't supported these types of um, initiatives or your representative hasn't, giving them a call, going, asking for a meeting, asking to, to go and meet with them, whether it be in Springfield, I would recommend back in district because that usually gets more attention. Um, and it, calling, emailing, giving them your perspective, letting them know why it is so critical for you that they support this legislation. Um, I think those, both of those things are really important. Mm -hmm. I'll say from AARP, I was gonna completely support everything the representative and the Senator just said. I mean, we do these reports, we do this research, we have the data, but data doesn't pass bills, people pass bills. And, and the most important way we can pass a bill is to tell our story. And there's so many strong stories just on this call today um, that it's incredibly important. It could be really, really powerful. So let's tell our stories, call each and every one of our senators and representatives, and that's how we'll get this legislation passed. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I don't see any more questions from the audience. Um, so unless you get it in real quick, I'm gonna, uh, unfortunately we're gonna move on, but I've really enjoyed you know, hearing this policy panel. I, I of course uh, enjoy and love working with Ziv Collins and Senator Villa. Um, 
We can't wait till we can all be back in Springfield in January and, and hit the ground running on this legislation. And uh, now um, I believe we'll hear from storyteller Lee Payne. Electrifying energy. I was from my bed to open my blinds from my view of the magnificent Chicago skyline and frosty Lake Michigan. Living high but feeling low. My mind was in the clouds over the lake. You see, today I would move on to another view. A view of my digestive system. My destination, the University of Chicago Center for Discovery. My body was drained of what's was once electrifying energy. I was slow to get dressed. Uncertainty entered my mind a million times over again. What would they discover? The past few months for me were filled with whys. Why did I feel this way? Why me? Why no one seems to know why? For the first time in my life, I felt alone. Without hope and helpless, I searched my soul for that black lesbian warrior spirit that once was, but was no more. I had no armor, no protection for the free radicals that were attacking my anatomy. Stripped of my being, but determined to continue to stand, and that I did. Within the next two hours, I had arrived at the hospital for another dreaded and undesired medical adventure. My anxiety was raging and rising now on the ceiling of my enclosed space, a bed, chair, and a device to monitor my vital signs. The anesthesiologist approached the bed, documents in hand. I followed his eyes as he glanced over them. He then looked at me strangely and stated, I was reviewing your results from last week. So you have the same disease Walter Payton had. Walter Payton is dead, I responded. The great running back for the Chicago Bears, the Hall of Famer. He was famous, wealthy, healthy, and only 44 years old when his short life ended. He explained to me that I have PSC, primary sclerosis conolitis, a rare and debilitating disease that affects only three in 100,000 people and leads to cirrhosis and liver failure. There is no treatment or no cure for this disease. I was shocked and I was afraid. The tears covered my face. I would no longer exist. One's who life was about to end, I thought. I don't recall much more about that day, but my numb body returned home with unidentifiable emotions. The following day, I received a call from the hepatologist. She spoke as if she was irritated. I thought, how ironic. She confirmed my diagnosis and told me to go to the county because it would be 30 days before my insurance would be effective. 
the county, I thought, it would take months for me to get an appointment. You see, my existence meant absolutely nothing to her, and her existence meant absolutely nothing to me. So I said, F you, and hung up the phone. Two weeks later, depressed and frail, I asked a friend to take me to Northwestern Hospital. Again, a room full of doctors. But I mustered up enough strength to tell my story and to ask for help. After 25 years as a social worker advocating for and providing healing spaces for children with no homes, women who were abused, and anyone considered a have not, I figured I had better do a damn good job of advocating for me. You see, dying was not on my agenda, and my life would not cease to be purpose-driven. Minutes later, an attractive physician with a smile returned to my room with the words that I so desperately needed to hear. I am going to help you. Maybe there was some miscommunication between you and the other doctor, she stated. These words kept breath in my body, but two years later, I was no longer able to work. 2013, I was homeless, jobless, and was living off of the generosity of my high school friend, John, who I had reconnected with after 30 years. Unlike my biological brother, who I love with everything I have, John loved me unconditionally, and so did my adopted church family. They were my support. I waited two years to get a check for under $800 from SSI. I waited another two years for SSDI. You see, I had worked from the time I was 16 years old, but they only saw fit to give me a monthly check that still does not cover my basic needs. I had to move into a building managed by slumlords. After visiting the Chicago Housing Authority office, and being told that the housing waiting list was 25 years. Today, I still wait. I live in the third largest city in the United States, but there is no adequate housing for me to live or heal. Eating healthy, that's not an option because according to the Department of Human Services, my $1,400 a month that I paid into the system allows them to only give me $48 a month and SNAP benefits and requires a $550 spend down payment for Medicaid that I cannot afford. My name is Lee. I am a queer woman who was once the provider for those living in poverty and distress. Today I am them and they are me. But ain't this America, home of the brave and man of the free? Have I not been brave and courageous? Even though you may refuse to acknowledge my humanity and refuse to validate me, I ask that you please not take away my life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness, for I would never, ever take away yours. I think we're going to try to play the other story as well, which would be Larry, Larry Les Prince. You say your name to tell others who you are. My name is Larry. It was a problem from the start. I couldn't pronounce L or R. Tough when your name is L-A-R-R-Y. I needed speech therapy during kindergarten so I could say my name. My legal name is Larry, not Lawrence. Yet in elementary school, teachers called me Lawrence, no matter what my birth certificate says. 
a bank teller, made me endorse my paycheck for delivering newspapers a second time because she insisted I must be Lawrence. In high school, teachers called me Larry in class, but my records, my report cards, my diploma say Lawrence. I gave up asking to be me. I became a teacher. When I started teaching, a gay man would be fired if the school district could prove he was gay. To keep my job in the bars, at first I would say, my name is Michael. At least until I sensed I wanted to see you again, then I'd tell the truth and be wary. The men I met in the bars, they understood. They also used fake names to keep a job or so family wouldn't find out. I belong to the Chicago Prime Timers, a club with 212 gay senior men. We have 15 social events a month, a monthly buffet dinner at Ann Sather's restaurant, bowling, and small groups which meet in members' apartments to play cards, double train dominoes, or to talk about a book. We have a membership directory so members can stay in touch with each other despite ever-changing email addresses or changing cell phone numbers, or when a member moves to a new apartment. We email an updated directory to members every six months. We board members. We know that perhaps 30% of the club's members choose to not be listed in the directory. Some have no listing in the directory at all. Some are listed only by their initials. Some list the fake name they used in the bars when they were younger. Some of our members were previously married and have children. Where once they feared being denied visitation to their children if the ex-wife could prove that they were gay. Today as senior citizens, they fear that if their adult children do a computer search for dad's name and see him listed in a gay club's directory or in the newsletter as hosting a poker game in his apartment, the relationship will change. They fear not seeing their grandchildren. It doesn't matter that the directory is delivered only to members and members must have an access code. It doesn't matter that the newsletter's public version uses first names only. Fear is not reasonable. In a club as big as ours, you may sit next to a man of hot luck for the first time, even though you both belong to the club for years. As you chat, you learn you have common interests. You know Jacob on his name tag. You don't trade phone numbers because tomorrow, You'll look for Jacob in the directory. You'll ask to meet for dinner or to see a movie. You'll phone because you need some new friends. You feel isolated. Your best friend died or has moved away or due to health issues. He doesn't go out much anymore. You can't find Jacob in the directory. The chance to connect, to move past feeling isolated, to widen your support network. That chance is lost. Club member Charles White loved people. He worked as a bartender on Amtrak trains. He liked it when customers sat at the bar to talk to him. The view out the window of the train was pretty, but it was the same pretty view on the same route every day. Talking to people was better. Charles also worked part-time as a travel agent. His retirement plan was to organize group tours along the rivers of Europe for his friends. One week, one week after Charles retired from Amtrak, he suffered a major stroke and entered a hospital in Northwest Indiana. He wanted to visit. Given that this spent driving more than an hour into Indiana, and since I was not sure whether the air unit allowed visitors, I phoned first. 
the hospital receptionist told me, we don't have a patient named Charles White. It was four days before the only member of the club who knew his real name heard that I was looking to visit Charles. Charles White was a fake name he had used in the club for 20 years. I visited Charles the next day. He was now in a coma. His sister was in the room. She was just pleased that her brother's friend was reaching out. I finessed my answer when she asked me, how do you know my brother? I didn't know if Charles was out to his family. Charles' wife died a day later. He died not knowing that a member of the club came to see him. I wonder how many LGBTQs don't join a senior center or don't apply for support services because they have two names and they don't feel comfortable explaining why. They might fear meeting someone who knows them by the other name. They might fear having to explain the truth either to the friend or to the staff. Keeping the secret is their number one priority. Names have power. They say who you are. Trading names brings others closer. When your real name is hidden, names keep others at distance, leaving you isolated. Keeping your secret carries a heavy price. So, who are you? Let's trade names. Thank you to both Lee and Larry for sharing their stories. We really appreciate it. We also really appreciate all of you for bearing with us during our technical difficulties. Um, we're running a little behind schedule, so we might keep you an extra few minutes, but it should be smooth sailing from now. And hello, my name is Kennedy Bradley. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Community Outreach and Education Specialist for Getting to Zero Illinois at the AIDS Foundation Chicago. Um, GTZ is a statewide initiative to end the HIV epidemic in the state by 2030, with the goals of getting down to zero new HIV transmissions and getting those living with HIV engaged in affirming care. It is my pleasure to introduce the GTZ panelists in the order that they will be speaking. First, we have Rick Guasco, who is the creative director of Positively Aware, an HIV AIDS treatment and health magazine published by a Chicago nonprofit AIDS service organization, TPAN. A native Chicagoan, he studied journalism at Columbia College, graduating in 1985. In 1992, he discovered he was living with HIV when, when he developed Kaposi sarcoma, which the CDC classified at the time as an end-stage AIDS-defining illness. He successfully underwent interferon treatment through a clinical trial. He first served as art director of Positively Aware in the mid-1990s and then returned to the magazine in 2010. He is also creator of A Day with HIV, the magazine's annual anti-stigma campaign. Diagnosed in 2016, he is also a survivor of anal cancer. As an advocate, Rick's primary interests are coexisting conditions for people living with HIV, developing intergenerational opportunities for older and younger people living with HIV, telehealth, and addressing the digital divide. Next, we have Joseph Nell, who is the founder of the AIDS Survivor Syndrome Support Group Chicago. He has been working in the healthcare field his entire career, first as an inpatient nurse, then in behavioral health, and later in home health as a case manager for an HIV primary care program. He currently works as a training consultant for a leading value-based care company. And finally, we have Timothy S. Jackson who works as the Director of Government Relations for AIDS Foundation Chicago. His work at AFC includes developing and managing the organization's government relations activities, specializing in HIV-related state legislative matters regarding appropriations, healthcare reform, 
HIV decriminalization, LGBTQ plus issues, housing, and addressing health disparities through a racial equity lens. As a Black gay man living with HIV for nearly 12 years, Timothy's career is centered on advocating on behalf of people living with HIV, amplifying the voices of those most impacted, and addressing the effect HIV has on the communities where his identities intersect. Timothy is a lobbyist, a policy wonk, a foodie, a creative, a man of faith, but most of all, a fierce advocate. Timothy will serve as the moderator for the audience Q&A. And now I will hand the mic to Rick. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, I'll try to be brief, considering the, the time that we've got. Um, when I first found out that I had HIV, I had already developed uh, cat C sarcoma, as you heard. Um, if you don't know what that is, um, if you have ever seen pictures of AIDS patients from the 1980s, the early years of, uh, of the plague, um, you saw these spots that people had. Well, that's what I was developing. And in fact, at its peak, I had 150 KS lesions throughout my face and body. I looked like I looked like I had two black eyes and a swollen lip, uh, not to mention the spots that covered my arms and legs. But even so, I I resolved two things: one, that I was not going to become a, another AIDS victim, but also that I was not going to become a victim to stigma. And in fact, um, I didn't didn't have much choice in the matter because um, you could see clearly that something was you know that I was living with something because of all these spots. And um, not having a choice, I just decided to take charge and, um, and to be public um, about uh, living with, with AIDS. Um, and so that's why stigma has always been such an important um, uh, part, uh, concern for me, because I think stigma affects everybody regardless of their HIV status. Stigma prevents people from getting tested to finding out their status to find out how healthy they are. Stigma prevents people from getting treatment. People um, who are stigmatized are isolated. And um, I also want to say that I think all stigma becomes self-stigma because what people think of you, what people think about HIV, obviously affects you. Um, as far as um, getting to zero, my basic thought is that the um, is that until we treat the most vulnerable people, until we address the needs of the most vulnerable in our society, we're not going to cure it, solve it, or succeed at addressing it. And by it, I mean not only HIV, but even this pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has proven, has exposed rather, the disparities that exist in our society and in healthcare. And once again, until we address the needs of the most vulnerable, we're not going to, we're not going to get out of this situation. Um, disease knows no boundaries. And we have to break down those bond boundaries in order to succeed. So that's my bit. Joseph, I think that you are next. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. Let me share my screen. Everyone see my screen? Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I'm the founder of the AIDS Survivor Syndrome Support Group, um, something I started about three years ago, um, basically for high 
um, discovered something about myself that I didn't know that I'd been suffering from for about 18 years, uh, which is AIDS survivor syndrome. And I think um, it's important to explain what that is. Um, AIDS survivor syndrome um, describes the spectrum of sustained trauma sur survivorship resulting from living through the AIDS epidemic, um, one of the worst pandemics in modern history. Uh, most vulnerable are those individuals who, who became HIV positive in the 1980s and 1990s when having HIV was considered a terminal diagnosis. Um, it's the constellation of physical, psychological, and emotional symptoms that a person either HIV negative or HIV positive may experience after living through intense grief and trauma during the years of the AIDS epidemic and after. Okay. Oops. And um, this, ter this term was actually coined by HIV activist um, Tez Anderson from San Francisco. And in 2013, he created the nonprofit organization Let's Kick ASS or AIDS Survivor Syndrome in 2013. And this was after a meeting that he scheduled that he thought maybe 40 or 50 people would, would um, attend and four, over 400 people um, came. And, and those are people who experienced the experience the symptoms of AIDS survivor syndrome. And some of the symptoms um, that have been validated as far as AIDS survivor syndrome are depression, panic from unexpected older age, lack of future orientation, irritability, nightmares, social withdrawal and isolation, emotional numbness, anxiety and nervousness, difficulty falling asleep, feeling tense on guard or hypervigilance, and one of the ones that I think has to do with getting to zero is sexual risk-taking. Um, I was 22 when the AIDS epidemic started and I'm 62 now, so 40 years later. Um, and as we've seen, there's an uptick in um, HIV cases in, um, in, the, in seniors. Um, and this, this um, AIDS survivors was actually validated in the 2017 behavioral health study it was conducted by a researcher, Ron Stahl, um, as part of the multi-center AIDS cohort study. Okay. Um, and I will tell you, I discovered this by chance. Um, I, I work for healthcare companies and about three years ago, I was, we were um, creating a HIV uh, case management program for three healthcare organizations in Florida. And I was very <laughs> concerned about what was going on. And I Googled and found uh, Let's Kick Ass um, online. And then I discovered all these symptoms. And I was like, this is what I've been going through for the last 18 years. Um, and I realized I needed to do something about it, let the company I work for know so that they could have the case managers um, be aware of this. And I also knew I needed to do something to let other people know about this. So I started the AIDS Survivor Syndrome Support Group in Chicago. And um, what is needed? Um, well, there needs to be societal awareness of this complex PTSD-like condition within the L LGBT senior community. Uh, we need appropriate trauma-informed behavioral health services for those who are affected. Um, we also need education and training for behavioral health specialists working with LGBT seniors who may experience this condition. And then also we need, we need more peer-led support groups. Um, the only one I know of is one in San Francisco and the one that, um, that's been ongoing for the last three years in Chicago. And um, if, if anyone wants more information about AIDS survivor syndrome, you can go to the Let's Kick AIDS Survivor Syndrome website at Let's kickass.hiv um, and anyone who feels maybe that this is a, a place that they would like to go, you can also join our AIDS Survivor Syndrome Support Group. Um, it's every Saturday from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Central Time um, and it's on Zoom. You can also contact me at jodybochi at yahoo.com um, and we also have an AIDS Survivor Syndrome Support Group Chicago Facebook page. Um, um, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't 
if I hadn't learned about this and it was by chance. And so I know there's probably other people out there that also could benefit from this. So thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you so much, Rick. Again, my name is Timothy Jackson, Director of Government Relations for AIDS Foundation Chicago, pronouns he, him, and his. In my capacity at, at AFC, I serve as our state government lobbyist, and so, so excited this year to be able to craft legislation uh, to really address the disparities that we experience with HIV here in Illinois, and to really hit home some of the goals and priorities um, and, and achieve the goals and priorities of the statewide plan to end HIV, getting to zero Illinois. And so um, we understand that although the plan was put in place in 2019, the state has not allocated specific dollars uh, to address some of the, the things that we really need um, in the broader HIV community statewide. And so um, we know that in order to fulfill these goals and priorities that the state will need to make some key investments um, when it comes to HIV testing, prevention, and care, um, including access to PrEP. Um, but as both Joseph and Rick mentioned, um, there are other things that people living with a vulnerable to HIV experience, whether that's um, a survivor syndrome or dealing with internalized and or externalized stigma. Um, and so we know that people living with HIV lead complex lives. Uh, with a number of different things that affect us. Um, and so our response to HIV um, and to ending this, HIV, uh, the, this epidemic here in Illinois should be just as complex, just as nuanced. And so, um, as I mentioned, really, really excited to be able to introduce um, legislation, the Getting to Zero uh, Illinois Omnibus Bill that will include $15 million dollars and critical investments, as I mentioned, to help us advance the goals and strategies of the Getting to Zero Illinois Plan to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. And so um, I'm just gonna go over them very, very briefly. I am also going to put in the chat the link to House Bill 4264, which has already been filed. Um, our sponsors will be House Majority Leader uh, Greg Harris, and Senator Doris Turner, um, she represents uh, uh, Springfield, so Sangamon County uh, in uh, central uh, Illinois. Um, and so just going to go over these very, very briefly, but we're going to be looking at uh, investments for HIV, SCI, and LGBTQIA cultural competency and humility training for providers, an employ employment referral program for people living with HIV or vulnerable to HIV, as well as the broader LGBTQ community. We're looking at a statewide getting to zero and a U equals U uh, public education campaign. For those of y'all that are not familiar with U equals U, U equals U stands for undetectable equals untransmittable, meaning that a person living with HIV with the undetectable viral load cannot transmit the virus. Um, and so we're also looking at a program to identify those people living with HIV, not currently in care. Uh, also, we were wanna talk about include, uh, increasing access to PrEP and PEP, um, understanding that housing is healthcare, um, that, you know, as I say, kind of very tongue in cheek sometimes, that if, you're, don't, if you don't have somewhere to lay your head in the evening, you're not worried about taking a pill. Um, and so we, we want to be very clear about housing and self care, a program for populations reentering society from incarceration. Uh, both Rick and Joseph touched on the importance of, uh, of addressing stigma in a meaningful way. And so we want to be very intentional about stigma reduction programs, um, as well as looking at capacity building for our Black led and Latinx led. Uh, community-based organizations to be able to do some things that they need in their communities, um, as well as an at-home HIV testing program, again, to address stigma in a very meaningful way to allow people to be able to test from the comfort of their own home um, and then also be referred out to a provider if necessary. Um, and so all of these, like I mentioned, um, it's $15 million. If you do click on that link, there is a breakdown um, to, you know, what each line item will be. 
um, a large portion of that, again, understanding the importance of housing um, is, is focused on housing um, for people living with HIV to uh, make sure that they have everything that they need in order to uh, not only be safe and healthy, but remain in care as well. And so those are some of the types of things that we're so excited to do. We're so thankful to have Leader Harris and Senator Turner as our champions um, for, for House Bill 4264. The Senate bill will have a number two. It just needs to be filed later this week. Um, and so we'll make sure to get that out as well as additional information um, as it becomes available. So with that, I think we have, um, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. see. Doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. Okay, well, I am going to, if you have more questions specifically about this GTZ bill or any other policy priorities that AFC or Equality Illinois um, are, are doing, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and so with that, I am going to kick it over to Kim L. Hunt uh, to close us out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Kim Hunt. I'm the executive director of Pride Action Tank, which is a, a project of AIDS Foundation Chicago, where I also serve as the senior director of policy and advocacy operations. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you all for beginning your day with us. We are actually going to end on time, uh, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, I, please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to all of our speakers today uh, for joining us and sharing their, their wisdom and their expertise, um, particularly our storytellers um, who um, just shared such um, vulnerability with us in service of making sure that we are uh, creating legislation and actions that really do help uh, LGBT plus older adults. Um, we thank you for um, all being here. I also wanna thank the AFC and Equality Illinois communications teams for their behind the scenes work. Uh, and I want to call out Deontay's keys in particular for MacGyvering uh, his way to make sure that we were able to see the videos. I uh, also want to thank our funder, RRF Foundation for Aging. A special, special thank you goes out to our sponsors, State Senator Karina Villa and State Representative Lakeisha Collins. Uh, I agree with what Mike said earlier. We could not ask for two better sponsors for this legislation. I would be remiss and banned from the next meeting if I didn't also thank our out aging committee for their work throughout the year. Mary Anderson, Don Bell, Jacqueline Boyd, uh, Katie Fasulo, uh, Timothy Holt, Phyllis Johnson, Antonio King, Britta Johnson, Walter Gomez, uh, Kelly Rice, Nick Westrade, and Terry Warman and Mike Ziri, all members of the out aging team. We'll, we're gonna be sending out information and advocacy requests to support the disrupting disparities of LGBTQ older adults bill, as well as the GTZ omnibus bill throughout the legislative session. And if you wanna be kept apprised of these and other advocacy efforts, I'm gonna put the link to Pride Action Tank's um, uh, sign up page in the chat here feel free to sign up for our newsletter to be kept apprised of all those good things uh, and visit our website, prideactiontank.org, uh, as well as the websites of AIDS Foundation Chicago and Equality Illinois and AARP Illinois. Uh, I wanna wish you a great day as well as a healthy, peaceful, joyous holiday season, and look forward to working with all of you in 2022. Thank you again.